La la. I will begin with a word of prayer. Ahem. <clears throat> Just pause what you're doing here for a second. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. I thank you for these students and for their test being done. And uh, just help us to learn a little bit more about your creation today and to glorify you in what we do, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. So um, if you didn't get your test back yet, that means that somehow I've lost your test. Sorry. No. It means that you took the test like at a late time or something. I just haven't gotten to it yet, but I will. And um, if you really want to know, just... Come to my office hours after class. I'll grade it in about five minutes and get it to you. All right? So. Um, and I think I still have like a, a quiz two to grade. So if I haven't get graded your quiz two yet, it's probably because you took it late and I just didn't get to it yet. All right? But I will. Um, now, if I don't get to your <laughs> quiz two in like a week, then yeah, you probably should come bother me. All right, let's talk about the solution to the test right quick because I know you guys want to know, I think. Well, some of you don't. Some of you got a perfect score, so you're like, boring. So, there's a few of you like that. Smart people. All right, here we go. So, is, gonna, is it focusing? Looks like it. By the way, the top hat is what? 20. Uh, 29.76. If you haven't done it already, please do it. I want to close that. I don't like leaving the top hat virus open on my machine. As soon as I can kill it, the better. All right, so there we go. Number one, calculate simple interest earned given the principles 8,050, 8, the rate's 4% in one year. So you take I equals PRT, you get $322. That was A. Um, your electric bill's 122, 12% simple interest. You want the principal plus PRT, which is this formula here. You plug in the numbers. The T here is one quarter because three months is um, one fourth of a year. And by default, the rates are always yearly, right? So that gives you 125.66, which was B. Um, let's see here. C. Um, whoop. C here, how many four letter words can be created from the usual 26 character alphabet? So you've got 26 for the first choice, 25 for the second choice, 24 for the third choice, 23 for the fourth choice. So you multiply those numbers, you get 358,800. And so that was the choice there. You could also calculate that by using the permutation of 24, um, taking six, like four arrangements of four things from 26 things, which is this formula, which again simplifies to 26 times 25 times 24 times 23. So there's that. The pizza problem here, you had 11 toppings, and you're going to pick seven of them. So that's 11, choose seven, which works out to 330. So the answer was D there. <laughs> It'll snow tomorrow with a probability of 0.61. What's the probability it will not snow tomorrow? Um, well, you use the complementary probability, one minus the probability, you get 0.39. I think pretty much everybody got problem five, which is good. If you didn't get problem five, uh, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to belittle you or something. Uh, let's see here. Oh, look at that. See, if I wanted to be mean, what I should have done is make the correct answer to problem number five, D. Maybe next test, I'll make the next page have the correct answer. And chaos will ensue as people forget to turn the page, right? You ever had experience like that? I was in graduate quantum mechanics and uh, we had our first test and we were all talking to each other after the test and we we're like, hey, I, I feel okay about that test. The one guy was like, yeah, I feel really good. I, 
I definitely got 100 points. And we were like, there were, um, there were 200 points on that test. And he's like, what? And we were like, did you, did you do the backside? He's like, there was a backside. <laughs> so it's so sad. That poor guy. But anyway, I try not to do that kind of thing on here, you know, in here that much. If I do, it's just for the sake of comedy. All right. <clears throat> Let's see here. A snack bag of candies. Got 22 candy, 22 reds, 30, 13 blues, 18 browns, 17 purples, 30 rainbows. So if you add those all up together, you get 100. The ones we're interested in are brown or purple. So that's 18 plus 17, which is 35. 35 over 100 gives you 0.35, which is 35% chance of picking either the brown or the purple. Find the area to the nearest thousandths of the standard normal distribution between the z-scores minus 111, 1.11, and 0.29. So we can use um, the, um, the theorem, if you like, from page five, the re revised page five of my lecture 14, I think it was, that I told you guys to look at. And anyway, so if you do that, we pull the minus out from here, right? And that gives us the plus. You look these up on the table, you got 0.497 and 0.367. You add them, you get 0.864. The answer was A. Um, suppose a class earns grades of 20, 30, 33, 45, 56, 67. Oh, I didn't do eight? Oh, yeah, I didn't do eight. Sorry. Um, yeah, let me s maybe move that up a bit. Man, there's some kind of glare there. Uh, oh well, whatever. Um, the professor finds grades in a large class are normally distribution. That, that seems grammatically questionable. Hmm. I think I should have said normally distributed, right? Yeah. So you guys can take points away from the, ing from the English class I'm not taking right now, right? No? You know the reason I'm here, I was almost not here talking to you guys because I, um, if I'd done what I wanted to when I was about your age, I wouldn't have gone into what's called electronics at the community college, which means I would never have taken physics, which means I would never have gotten back interested in math, which means I would have never gotten sucked into the university system, never to graduate again. Um, like I am never going to graduate. I'll be here till I die probably. And. Um, I wanted to do wiring. You know why I wanted to do wiring at the community college? I may have told you already. It's, it's just that, I think I already told you, but I'll tell you again. It's because wiring only had one English class, whereas electronics had two. I was like, two? That sounds like too many. One, one English class for, for university, that sounds better. But he made me take the other thing, and here I am. But as you can see, some things I still haven't learned. OK, anyway, um, let's see here. So the mean of the grades is 63, the standard deviation is 10. The professor decides to what? Give a grade of A to the students in the top 16% of the class. What's the cutoff score? So what we're looking for is like the, this, this top piece here to be 16%. But remember the, um, the empirical rule that I drew on the board for you guys in class, before class, because somebody asked me about it fortuitously. Who asked about that? Because that was a really good question to ask right before the test, you know? Anyway, um, so that being 16 means that you're beyond the z-score of 1, right? Because you've got 34% here and here, and then you've got 16% in this tail, and you've got 16% over here. Um, so looking at the empirical rule, you can read 16% is going to be from, is it going to be beyond where we have the standard devi uh, excuse me, the mean plus the, the standard deviation, which here is 73. 63 plus 10 is 73. So um, like I say here, 34% of the scores are between 63 and 73. 50% are below 63. You put that together, you've got 84%, which means that 16% are left over. Hence, we want to use 73 as the cutoff score. Um, the other way to do this would be to look at AZ equal to 0 0.340, right? This is kind of what I did in the quiz. In the quiz, I didn't use the normal distribution for this problem, right? I mean, I didn't use the empirical rule. 
I used the table. And there, what we did was we figured out the z-score we wanted for the cutoff, and then we, we, we back-traced what, we figured, excuse me, we figured out what, um, what area we needed for the cutoff past the midway point, and then we looked it up on the table to work backwards. So, um, like the other way to do this would be to say, oh, okay, well, I need, I need if, if I want to have 16% up here, I need 34% between zero and the z-score that I'm interested in, which means I need a sub z equal to 0 0.340. And if you look at the table, you'll see that's approximately a z-score of one. And if you have a z-score of one, you can solve that for one is equal to x minus the mean over 10, which gives you 73. So there's two ways to do this. The one is like super lazy and based on people recognizing, oh, if I want 16% of the normal distribution, then that means I need to be one standard deviation past the mean. That's where I get 16% of the data. Some of you did it that way, which was based on the pictures we had up on the board here, right? But the second way to do it is more analytically, which is backtracking off the z-score table like this. Now, the, the second method would have worked if I had done something less friendly, like said, oh, I don't know, the top 12%, right? If I change that to the top 12%, the empirical rule isn't going to help you. You got to fall back on the, the second way of thinking, which is the way we thought about it in the solution to quiz two, all right? <coughs> and of course, this was also a web assigned problem, right? All right, so um, anyway, problem nine, I give you a list of grades. How many grades are there there? Some of you assume there were 10. Um, Wait a minute, did I assume there were 10? Oh, no, that's just, this is, this has worried me for a second here. I'm like, what, wait, wait, what? Oh, that's from this problem, duh. Um, but here, you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So if you take all these numbers, add them together, divide by 13, you get 63.54, all right? Um, the median is the middle, uh, these are ranked, this is a ranked list, right? L smallest to biggest, right? So the one in the middle is the median, and the one in the middle also happens to be the mode because I gave you three 71s, and that's the number with the greatest frequency, so the mode was also 71. Um, the percentile is 11 over 13 times 100. The reason for that is, remember, percentile is based on the number of scores lower than your score, so you shouldn't include your own score in the calculation of the percentile. I didn't take out a, a lot. If you put 12 here instead of 13, I just took off three points because I think you're really close to what's right. And when you're dealing with very large numbers, this issue doesn't matter. But in my defense, I did make an announcement about this the day before the test to try to forewarn you of this issue. So, you know, if you don't have announcements on in Canvas, I can't change that. That's up to you. So, all right. Um, this one here. Some of you are like, my calculator won't do it. Yes, I know, that's why this problem is on the test. Um, because I want to see if you can calculate with a factorial like we've done a fair amount of in problems. And a lot of you got this. I would say it's about 50-50. People got this, didn't get it. Something like that. Um, but it's just this, 1,000 factorial is 1,000 times 90, 999 times 998 factorial those cancel and it just leaves you with 999,000 when you multiply them. Um, problem three is just a plain old calculate the mean, median, standard deviation and variance for a small data set. It is what it is. A lot of you have trouble with calculators. Look, I have trouble with calculators too. See, I got it wrong before I corrected it. Um, so, you know, follow man and stuff like that. So um, the mean was the sum over five, but the, the variation we have to divide by four because it's a sample, right? So that gives us, ends up giving us the 42.8 over four, which gives you 10.7-ish for the variance, and the square root of that's the standard deviation, which is about 3.27. Um, so there is a great diversity in how people got this wrong. I can't even categorize all the different wrong ways people did this. Um, there's a fair number of you who just divided by five instead of four, and I didn't take off as much for that error as others. And then problem four um, is kind of the same as the other problem earlier. 
So I'm sorry, it was kind of boring. It was two of these. That was a, um, an unfortunate event. If I had to do it over again, I would make this one a little bit different, um, or the other one a little bit different. But anyway, so if the life expectancy of turtles in Japan follows a normal distribution with a mean of 80 and a standard deviation of 13, what's the probability a turtle will live past 93? So what you're looking for um, is the amount of area in the normal distribution past one standard deviation from the mean. And by the empirical rule, that's 16%. So, yep. Of course, you could also look at the uh, you could also look at the Z table and work backwards from the theorem that I gave on revised page five of lecture 14. That's another way you could do this one. Although, in, in, this is not this this is not actually this is I shouldn't say that this is exactly the same as problem multiple choice eight. Why? Well, the difference here is that I give you the 93, right? By analogy, you're looking for the 93 in some sense with the multiple choice eight. So they are logically different problems, but so that's it. Any questions? If you've got questions about your particular grading, you should come talk to me about an office hours, yeah? All right, so let's, let's go on here. So I gave you guys a handout, right? Everybody have this thing? So I found this on the Google. I forget which uh, university had this posted. I can, let me, let me find it back out here again. I want to give credit where credit's due if I can. See if I can go back to the other. Ah. <coughs> all right. Oh, first of all, credit where credit's due. This is from uh, somebody at Illinois. Um, username D uh, D I P S A Q U one, math one eighty one. So whatever that is. See, this is, the, this is the reason we should always put our name on stuff, so that like when somebody else is stealing your stuff in some other course, in some other university, they can give you credit, you know? Oh, well. Anyway, that's where I found it. Okay, so, but it's relevant to our course, because this is like the motivating problem for graph theory um, that's discussed in, in, your, in your textbook. So I just wanted to give you a piece of paper and let you try it for yourself. So here's the... Here's basically the challenge, is to do what? Well, let me read through it here together. So, in the town of Konigsberg, there are a pair of islands connected to the mainland and the other by seven bridges. So, challenge one, can you find a route through each city so that you cross each bridge exactly one time? If you start crossing a bridge, you have finished crossing it. So, in other words, no doubling back, all right? Um, you can record your walk as a sequence of numbers. The first number is the first bridge you cross, and so forth. Let's see here, so if you're having difficulty, try challenge two first. <laughs> huh. All right, let's see here. Do you want me to try? I don't know. I can try. So get out a pencil or something, you know? Try it for yourself. Everybody have one of these? You don't? How did you not get one? Oh, you, you handed it back to where? I just handed it to a full stack back and forgot to grab one. Oh, oh, oh. So it wasn't some kind of like conspiracy by your peers or something? Okay, it's good, it's good. It's all you? I must have some extras. Are there extras over here? Aha. Here you go. Anybody else? Thank you. So let, let's try it, let's try it out. Let's see if we can, oh man. This st stupid printout is all glary in my, uh, so, I mean, pick some starting point. What are the instructions? We have to cross each bridge exactly one time. So if I start here, let me use a different color. Aw, oh, man, where my markers go?
let's see here the oh challenge two they destroy some of the bridges let's not do that all right so start here I got to cross each bridge one time right so I'm gonna do, I'm gonna start with five and then I'm gonna go is that seven or a one is that the one right I think that's a I think that's a one because seven's over here see it yeah so I'll, I'll, I'll go five to one and then I'm gonna go over here I'm gonna go through two right two and six were destroyed Oh, I'm, I'm ignoring that. Oh. I'm doing challenge one. So I'm going to go two to six. Don't worry, I'll do the other one with a different color. Where should I go? I guess I got to go to seven next, right? And then what happens? Then I can either go to three or to four, right? And it doesn't matter where I go, does it? If I go to four, like this, right? then I can't get to bridge three without doing what? Crossing without crossing a bridge I've already crossed, right? Wait, why? Well, because I'm here, right? I, I have to go either through this or this, which I've already crossed in order to get to the, to the, to the middle, you know? Yep. Can you start from the island? Start from the island? Sure, let's try that. So that one didn't work, did it? Let's, let's try starting from the island. Where do you want me to go first? Three. three. All right, so I'm starting with three. And then what, what, what do you want me to do next? Seven. Seven? There's really no wrong answer. We're just, we're just taking a stroll around Konigsberg here. Seven, then what? I either got to go to six or five, right? Which one do you want to do? But I can't go to four because where there's where four is up here. Oh, you want me to do four instead? Yeah. Rats. <laughs> Let me finish this one. I go to seven. I go over here to five. I go out to one. I go back here. I go to two. And then and then I go through six. And then oh man, now I'm stuck again. See that? Three seven. Five, one, two, six, and then I don't get the four, right? See, this one I didn't get the four. No. You said start in the middle, but do what this time? Actually, never mind. Oh, it, it went badly too? Yeah. Oh. So I think we can do this all day long, actually, because it's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> That's the point. It's impossible. But how do you, how do I know it's impossible? Because it just is? Well, this is the kind of problem that um, prompted <laughs> Euler, among others, to study what we call graph theory. So let me get that out here. So if you, don't, if you guys don't mind, I'm going to be a little bit lazy today and use the, uh, the textbook's um, ever so lovely um, PowerPoints. Because for some reason I ran out of time, like, I guess I was grading 100 tests between now and Tuesday for some reason. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm going to use the professionally prepared PowerPoints provided by the textbook. Um, I hope you don't think less of me for doing this. I do um, think less of me for doing this. But anyway, so graphs and Euler circuits. Um, oh, by the way, so put your name on the paper. That we just I sand it out, and I'll collect them. That'd be worth something to you, whether or not you. I, well, nobody got it right. It's impossible. Okay. Actually, rather than doing that, you guys keep the papers, which I will end up losing, because you'd like to have the paper, right? So what I'll do instead is I'll use the top hat to count you as having done this. All right. So. All right, so um, introduction to graphs. Here we go. So, a, so we'll, we'll, we'll get back to this bridge problem here in a minute, all right? But um, a branch of mathematics called graph theory illustrates and analyzes connections such as these. So you can draw a picture. Um, you've got a group of six people, right? And um, 
they're connected on this this thing called Facebook, I, I, Instagram maybe I don't know whatever you guys use right. Are, are you, any of you influencers? I don't know. Okay. I saw an advertisement in the elevator. They're looking for influencers, you know? It's exciting. Um, something about na selling natural products. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't like the sound of that at all. It could be some kind of like gateway to essential oils or something. I don't know. But, um, oh, I'm sorry. Essential oils are great. Yes. <coughs> What's that? No, oh, no. Oh, you're just stretching? All right, I'll allow it. Trying to find my laser <clears throat> so I can point at things more effectively or probably left it in my office. Well, oh well. I guess I'll use the mouse. Okay, so what this what would this graph mean? This would mean that um, so James, a very good name, is connected to Lisa. Heather and also Jared. Um, Heather apparently has got James, Amy, Lisa, and Juan as friends, right? Juan just has friends of Heather and Jared. Anyway, this is an example of a graph, right? A graph is a collection of nodes and edges. How many, how many nodes are there in this graph? One, two, three, four, five, six nodes. How many edges? One, two, let's see, let me count. One, two, Oh man, I'm not good at counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I think. I'm trying not to double count, you know? How many edges do you guys count? Seven? Yeah. Okay. So one of the things I was thinking that I should mention here, when you're looking at these graphs, you have to imagine that these, when, whenever there's no node, it's not a connection. So you could think of these as like insulated wires or something. They're laying over each other, but they're not actually making contact. Does that make sense? So like we're not, in, we're not talking about these crossings as being connections. It's just the nodes that are connecting things, okay? So um, again, like I said, a graph is a set of points called vertices and line segments or curves called edges. So that the, um, Here's a, um, here's a table which tells you different um, sort of connections, right? So like here, um, who's Amber have friends? Amber has friends, Oscar and Laura, right? Who, who does Laura has, Laura has friends what? Matt, Amber, and let's see here, Kayla has friends who? Just Oscar. So you could take this table and you could make a corresponding graph, right? If we're lucky, they'll have it done. Otherwise, I'm going to have to draw it out. Maybe I should draw it out. That would probably be better. If you guys can maybe take a, take a mental picture of this here for a second, right? Let me draw the graph for us by hand. I need to get a piece of paper out here. So I think the first problem in your web assign is roughly speaking based on this idea, all right? So let me get started here. I'm going to switch over. I'm going to switch over to the document camera. Come on. Come on. Come back to us. All right, there we go. All right, so I've got Matt. I've got Amber. I've got Oscar. I've got Laura. And apparently Kayla. <coughs> All right. Now we look at that table. All right. I'll go back to the table here at great risk to my lecture. So who should we connect? Matt, Matt should be connected. Matt's node should be connected to who? 
we should connect, what's that? Amber and Laura, right? So I connect Matt to Amber and Laura. All right? Like, all right, I'm not gonna do this 10 times. <laughs> this is gonna be it. All right, <laughs> Matt connects to Amber and Laura like that, all right? Then what? I go, I go look at Amber. Who's Amber connected to? Amber is connected to Matt. We already got that one, right? But also Oscar and Laura. Amber is connected to Oscar and Laura. All right? Let's see here. What, who's up next? How about Oscar? Who's Oscar connected to? Oscar is connected to Amber and Kayla. We already got the Oscar-Amber connection. So now we've got to look for Oscar connected to Kayla like so. Sounds like we're building some sort of uh, monster from like an 80s uh, sci-fi movie or something. Let's see, here. Um, let's see here. Laura, hidden on Laura. Yeah, Laura connects to Matt and Amber. Laura connects to Matt and Amber from the table. We already got those though. Good. And who's Kayla connect to? Just Oscar. Right, so there you go. This graph right here. This graph represents the table of interconnections that we looked at on the slide. All right. Let me go back to the let me go back to the PowerPoint here. All right. Now, if we're if we're lucky, I think they'll probably have the graph I just constructed. Here it is. See, so here's the uh, the pretty book version of it, but I wanted, to, I wanted to show you how we can draw it out piece by piece by just looking through the table, right? You, you guys could do this too for such a table, right? Okay. All right, so let me go on here. So in general, <clears throat> a graph can include vertices. I gotta find something. Sorry guys. I have buried my phone, I think. So in general, a graph can include vertices that are not joined to any edges, but all edges must begin and end at vertices. If two or more edges connect to the same vertices, they are called multiple edges. And if an edge begins and ends at the same vertex, it's called a loop. All right, so um, a connected graph, um, what's, what's it said to be connected? It's connected if you can get from any vertex to another by tracing along edges. Um, so like here, here's a picture. So this is, this is what we mean by multiple edges, right? Two nodes connected by two different paths. This is multiple edges. Sometimes we don't want that. This is a very silly graph. It's got five vertices, but no edges, right? Each node is on its lonesome. Um, so here we're looking at an example of, so this graph is not connected. Do you see why this is not connected? It's because I cannot trace along edges from say this point to get to over to any of these points, right? And I can't trace from this point to get over to here along the edges. So this graph is what's called disconnected. If you can get from any node, any vertice on the graph to another vertice, any other vertice on the graph by tracing along nodes, I mean tracing along edges, then it's called connected. This one is very pretty. Um, wait a minute. Seems like eh, that might be that might be bad. I don't know. I don't know. Every once in a while, my mom sends me what, like videos about the secret meaning of various like logos and things, and it's always like, really? I don't know. It's if it's upside down, it's trouble. All right. Well. I'll be careful not to turn my computer upside down. Let's see here. Um, anyway, the, the point, this is what's called a complete graph. A complete graph, what that means is that every, um, every vertex in the graph is connected to every other possible vertex. Check it out. So this vertex, vertex is connected to that one, that one, that one, and that one. And the same is true for any of the others. This vertex has an edge connecting it to this one, to that one, to that one, and to that one. So. Complete graphs are kind of special in that sense. They're sort of 
maximally connected if we only allow for single edges, if we don't allow for those multiple edges. Another important concept for graph theory that I don't think I've really tested you guys on, but I probably should have, um, is the concept of equivalent graphs. So these look different, right? I mean, they, obviously they look different, right? But these are equivalent from the viewpoint of graph theory because they have the same set of vertices and the same connections. See, if you look at the graph on the left, the, the vertex B is connected to what? A, B, C, and D, right? If you look at this one, the vertex B is connected to what? A, B, C, and D. If you look at this one, the vertex B is connected to what? A, B, C, D. If you look at the, the leftmost graph, vertex C, what's it connected to? Only B, right? How about this one, vertex C, what's it connected to? Only B. What's, how about this one, vertex C, what's it connected to? Only B, right? So two graphs are said to be equivalent if they have you know, if you, well, here's the tricky part. Two graphs are equivalent if you can label the vertices on one and the vertices on the other such that the connections between the vertices are the same between the two graphs. They don't have to look the same, they just have to have the same, let's say, connectivity. And so if you're a math major, you can, you can encode this by something called a, a relations matrix or adjacency matrix, and there are, there are ways of testing for it with mathematics, but we're just going to have to content ourselves to look at it. What do you think? Are these two equivalent? So like, is, is e, e is connected to what? A, B, C, and D, right? Is E connected to A, B, C, D here? It's con a, B, C, D, right? And how about B? B is only connected to D and E. B is connected to D and E. Yeah, I think, I think these are the same graph, actually. They're just, they look different, but it actually has the same connections. So I'm, I'm going to say that these are equivalent. Let's find out. So, all right. So let's talk about Euler circuits, because that's going to answer the question that I, well, the, the thing I made you try to do. Right, so to solve the, the Konigsberg bridge problem, we can represent the arrangement of land areas and bridges with a graph. So here's the thing. The, the picture you had, right, with the seven bridges. So what you do is you imagine the different land areas as a, as a vertex, right? So there's like the island vertex, there's the northern land vertex, there's the southern land, this, oh, it's Mordor, the Southlands vertex. Oh, I'm sorry, spoiler alert. Excuse me. Um, the, the, um, the eastern land um, vertex C here, and we can think of the bridges, the bridges as being edges. So this problem, right, tracing out the Konigsberg bridge problem is equivalent to tracing out paths in this graph. All right, so you can trade the problem of tracing out, you know, pictures in a uh, in a, in a map to tracing out paths in an equivalent graph. So, what is a path? A path is a movement from one vertex to another by traversing edges, all right? So, you know, what would A, B, C, A, what would A, B, A, C be? That would be A, you start at A, right? You go to B, we go back to A, and then we go back to C. That's a, that's a, what a stupid path. <laughs> like, what's that? I don't like that at all. How about this one? What's the path A, D, F, G, E, B, A? Um, let's see here. So you go start at A, D, F, G, E, B, A. So what's that? Uh, let, let, let me just do it again here, guys. Watch me. Watch me. So we start at A. We go to D. We go to F. We go to G, we go to E, we go to B, we go to A. So what, what happened there? We did what? We started at A, and we came back to A, and what, and what did we do? We never did what? We never used the same edge twice, right? That's analogous to never crossing the same bridge twice in our thinking, yeah? So, but, so that, that's an example of a circuit, 
Um, but we didn't cover all of the vertices, did we? We didn't, we didn't cover C, did we? No. So, and we didn't cover H either. But if you could get rid of H and C, we would have done everything else. By the way, I think if you destroy the two bridges in the challenge two, I think that one you actually can do, right? I see some nodding, yeah. So the path A, D, F, G, E, H is not a circuit. Why? Why is A, D, F, G, E, H not a circuit? The reason it's not a circuit, a circuit has to come back to where it starts, okay? So if it doesn't come back to where it starts, it's not a circuit. That one starts at A and it ends at H, so it's not a circuit. What is an Euler circuit? An Euler circuit is a path, which is a circuit, um, but it, 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 it uses every edge in your graph, all right? So that's what we were looking for with the Koenigsberg bridge problem. We were looking for a path which goes through every single bridge, right? Just once, but never twice, right? And it, and it start, basically has to, it starts, it has, you have to come back where you started. Also, that was the other terms and conditions for the game. So really what we were doing at that exercise, we were trying to find an Euler circuit for the Koenigsberg bridge graph. Um, oh, there is one for figure 5.5. See that? <laughs> Sorry. Um, let's see if we can just see it. Can you see the Euler circuit here? How about this? I I'm going to try it. I think we, if we start at A, right? You go A, D, F, G, H, E, C, B, oh man, A. I mean, I've gone through all the vertices, but I don't, I didn't, I don't think I crossed those two edges. Yeah. But he, they, they give us the, um, they give us the Euler circuit for this, for this graph on the next slide here. BDF, BDF, fine, I'll write it down. Just a second here. Um, I, I can't remember that, that's too much. B, D, F, G, H, E, C, B, A, D, it's got badge in it, B, A, D, G, E, B again. All right, so let me, let, now that I've got the, now that I got the solution here, let me go back to the picture and see if I can show it to you. All right, so we start at B, watch, you have to watch my finger here. We start at B, then we go to D, then we go to F. Then we go to G, then we go to H, then we go to E, then we go to C, then we go to B, then we go to A, then we go to D, then we go to G, then we go to E, then we go back to B. So if you could, if you could follow all that, we've gone all the, we've, we've hit every single every single node in this circuit and in this graph rather and, and, and we've crossed each edge just once. So that, what I just read, B, D, F, G, H, E, C, B, A, D, G, E, B, that path is an Euler circuit. <laughs> so why is it that this one has an Euler circuit but the Bridges of Konigsberg problem does not? Why? So, so here's the deal. The path that begins and ends at the same t vertex but does not use edges D, F, D, G. <sighs> well, I'm, I'm going to ignore that comment here for a second. Euler, this is, I want, this is, we, we're a little short on time. Let me just get to the point here. So Euler essentially proved that the graph in figure 5.4 could not have an Euler circuit. He accomplished this by examining the number of edges that meet at each, that met at each vertex. The number of edges that meet at a vertex is called the degree of the vertex. So let's, let's look at this. What's the degree of vertex D? You've got one, two, three. The degree of vertex D is three. How many edges are coming to vertex C? One, two, three. You got three vertices coming into, coming in C. What's the degree of A? Oh, A is interesting. One, two, three, four, five. The degree of A is five. And B also has degree three, right? 
So the degree of the vertex is the number of edges coming into it. So what Euler observed is he, he observed that in order to complete a desired path, every time you approach a vertex, you need to leave the vertex, right? And so if you travel through that vertex again, you would need an approaching edge and a departing edge. So in order for an Euler circuit to exist, the degree of every vertex would have to be an even number, right? Because with the Euler circuit, you're always in every single, in every single um, vertice in the Euler path, you're coming in and you're also going out, right? And you're never allowed to use the same in and out twice. So if you count, that means that there's a net, num a net even degree of all of the edges. In other words, <clears throat> like you said, for the uh, Euler circuit to exist, the degree of every vertex would have to be an even number. So look at your Konigsberg bridge problem. What's the degree of the vertices in the graph for the Konigsberg bridge? Um, let's see if, where, where's, let me find the graph. We had it earlier, right here. So this is the Konigsberg bridge. Here's its graph. What's the degree of this? Three, right? Three, three, and five. Like, certainly, every node in the graph of the Konigsberg bridge is not even. They have an odd number, right? There's an odd number of um, edges coming into these different points, which means that it can't be an Euler circuit. So for in order for the Euler circuit to exist, there has to be an even degree for each node. What happens if you cut, what, what, what does the worksheet tell us to do? Cut off what? Let me try to draw it on this paper here, if I can. So we were, we were cutting, which, which bridges were we going to annihilate? Two and six, which would be, uh, I got to translate <laughs> between my handout and the, ah, where'd it go? Maybe I should try to do it on the handout. So we're, we're, we're bashing, we're, we're crossing out two and six, right? Just a second, let me get back to the. So explode, come on, come on, come back to us. You can do it. All right, there we go. So this is gone. And that one's gone. So we've got <clears throat> the northern, the, uh, the island, Mordor, and the Eastlands. We've got, what, 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 what bridges exist still? Between the north, we have, this is seven, right? Uh, between the north, this, one, this one's four, right? This one's three. And between this one here is five, I think. And there's also this bridge. Do, do I have them all? Or did I miss something? Is that right? Hmm. Well, I don't know. Like I. I see that the um, the degree of this vertex is two, right? So, like the degree of the top and the bottom vertexes or are, are vertices are two, but the degree of these guys, this what's the, this one's three, and the degree of that one's three. So, I've got degree two, degree two, degree three, degree three. What, what, what did Euler's theorem say? Let me get back to it. Come on. So here's the, a connected graph is Eulerian <laughs> if, if and only if every vertex of the graph is an even degree. So even the, um, the, 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 the bridge with the, uh, the Konigsberg with bridges two and six destroyed. Hmm. Hmm. Well, there's something I don't understand there. Because it, you, guys, you guys told me on the one hand that you could get through it. I must not be reading something careful. I must be missing something here. 
Because it seems like we have a contradiction to this theorem with the exercise. Contradic so Eulerian means we start and begin, we end and we begin and end at the same point on the path and we use each edge once and only once. Hmm. I'm, I'm a little bit mystified by that. I'm going to have to think about that, guys. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, um, setting aside whatever thing I'm looking, I'm looking past something stupid and obvious and not understanding that, but let me think about it some more and I'll get back to you guys on that, all right? Um, but <clears throat> here, the question is, are these, do these have an Euler circuit? So if we trust the Euler's theorem, all right, then we can, we answer this question really simply. All we have to do is look, if we can find a vertex that has odd degree, game over, no Euler circuit, all right? So let's see here, anything here with odd degree? Degree two, degree two, degree two, degree two, degree two. This has an Euler circuit. On the other hand, this one over here, one, two, three, game over, degree three vertex, no Euler circuit. Simple as that. Yeah? So the one, the graph on the right would have an Euler circuit because it has, it would not have an Euler circuit because it has vertices of odd degree, whereas in the one on the right would. Um, and I, Whoa, how about this one? Determine whether the graph shown below is Eulerian. So what, what, what's, what degree does F have? One, two, three, four. What degree A have? Two. Degree B? One, two, three, four, five, six. Whoa. That's got degree two. One, two, three, four. Degree four. One, two, three, four. Degree four. Every vertex here has, yep. Extend the uh, extend the deadlines for the what homework? I'm just messing with you. Yes. Um, so, all right. <clears throat> Let me get through this, then I'll talk about homework in the remaining two minutes of class. Yeah. Um, so the answer is yes. This has every vertex has even degree. It's not time to leave yet. <laughs> it's <laughs> class is not over. Am I wrong? We still have three minutes. So. <laughs> this, this has even degree each, each, each vertex, vertex, so this should have an Euler path. The Euler path that it has is that. <laughs> now, I mean, he, they men he mentions that there is something called, there, there's an algorithm for finding the Euler circuit, but it's beyond this course, all right? And so basically we're just finding the Euler circuit by like um, trial and error essentially. But it, there, there it is for the, the previous one. So listen, guys, I will post this, um, this PowerPoint in, the, um, in Canvas. And um, yeah, we're, I've finished covering section 5.1, but you also have some homework on section 5.2, all right? And um, so you guys have a lot going on besides this class. And so I think to simplify your life, what I'm going to do, if this is OK with you guys, is I'm going to push the due date for all of the web assigns back to like the last day of class so that you can work on it when you have time. Yep. Oh, wow. I should have, I should have run for office or something. I missed my chance. So I will.